Good morning, everybody. Uh, my name is David Downs. I'm the California Bureau Chief for Leafly.com, and I'm the former cannabis editor for the San Francisco Chronicle. Thanks so much for joining us this morning at 9 a.m. sharp. I'm very proud of everybody here that made it, braved the cold and traffic and, and flu season and everything else. Thank you to the ICBC for having us down and for her, uh, throwing this event. Thank you to the Hilton for hosting us, and thank you to the sponsors, including Leafly. Feel free to download their app and look into advertising if you're a dispensary owner. Um, so what we have today here is the most powerful regulator in California cannabis. Uh, California is the biggest market and the most influential market here in the world. And the future is happening here first, you know, again. And we're gonna explore that future, but before I did that, I wanted to put a quick foundation under what we're gonna talk about. You know, I love being on the journalism beat. I've been on it for nine years. And because it's so full of these teachable moments in civics. And I thought I hated civics in seventh grade, shout out to Mr. Bender, but um, I, it, it ended up being a passion. So just to run through uh, real quick, we had Proposition 215 in 1996 that created a patient defense for marijuana, not a right. That's right, shout out to Prop 215, 1996. <laughs> Woo, uh, uh, we had SB 420 that followed that expanded the, the personal defense for uh, medical marijuana to a collective defense. Again, it was not a right. Um, in 2015, we, we regulated medical cannabis with the McRiza or the Macusa. You can figure out how you want to say that. Um, but then in 2016, we had Proposition 64, and this is where the rights kicked in. We all have personal rights to cultivate cannabis, and you can applause for that. Yeah, we have personal rights to possess it. We have personal rights to share it with other adults 21 and over, and now we have commercial licensing and taxes and regulations, which were TBD when we passed this in 2016, you know, set up, you know, with some guardrails like local control and taxes. Um, and that kicked off tens of thousands of hours of public comment. I can't, I don't know if you guys were tracking it, but it must have been interminable. And the state, uh, you know, threw out $100 million to form the Bureau of Cannabis Control. Um, Governor Jerry Brown tapped Ms. Lori Ajax here, who's, you know, known as a no-nonsense, no-drama, you know, technocrat from the Department of Alcoholic Beverage Control. And she's been a real steady hand at the wheel of a very turbulent plane that's being built as it flies here in California. And when you look at how far we've come, it's quite remarkable. We had commercial sales begin January 1st in 2018, and they began under temporary rules. This January 2019, we've had final rules come out, and we're starting to take stock of that last first commercial year. We have about 600 stores open in California. We did several hundred million dollars in tax revenue last year, and we're on our way to a billion dollars in annual tax revenue under a full license system. Um, you know, but the thing about the BCC, the Bureau of Cannabis Control, is they implement Prop 64 subject to other laws. They can't fight local control. Um, when it comes to the farms, that's under a different agency called the California Department of Food and Agriculture. When it comes to testing or kitchens, that's under a different department as well, the California Department of Public Health. We spread power around in America. We don't let it accrete in one place. Um, but the BCC does control, control stores, delivery, distributions, and other points of view. And we're going to talk about the future of those things with Ms. Ajax and Mr. Traverso. Please give him another warm round of applause. Good morning, thank you for being here. Um, so we have some, a, a new milestone kicking in and I'm seeing it on Instagram these days. Um, and that's people taking photos of their first annual licenses. And this is a big deal because um, you've never been able to get a license from the state of California to affirmatively like grow or distribute or do anything with cannabis until Prop 64. But those temporary licenses were much easier to get than these annual licenses. But now annuals are being issued and it's the year of annuals. I wanted to start there and talk a little bit about the number of annuals that have been issued and some of the biggest challenges to um, getting an annual and then how business people in this audience might be able to prepare uh, so they have a smoother experience in annual licensing this year. So we haven't issued very many annuals, as probably you know. The Bureau, I think we're around 21, but a lot of that is because uh, we have really primarily focused, especially during uh, November and December, on making sure we got people their temporary licenses, because that ability for us to issue temporary license went away at the end of, of last year. So 
Um, some good news on that is that in November and December, we were getting so many applications. In December alone, we issued uh, uh, over 1,400 temporary licenses. So I think that should be something we all should be thinking about because that was a big rise in temporary licenses. So now that people have their temporary and they have their extension so they can operate, so that's the that's probably most important. We want people out there, we want them operating. Now we move into looking at the annual application. And it, and it is challenging. It's, it's, it's a lot of rules, a lot of, uh, a lot of things that you have to provide to the Bureau, or, the, or whether it's the Bureau, Food and Ag, or Public Health. Uh, but we're working on trying to figure out what's the most challenging things for our applicants and how we can make it easier for them to comply with our, our rules and get the documents that we need. But we also have the provisionals, so don't forget about that. The What's annual, the, provisionals? the provisional, we have some, there was some legislation last year that was passed and we can issue provisionals, especially in situations uh, where you're waiting for the local jurisdiction to make a decision on the, uh, your sequel requirement, that's our environmental requirements, or if there's some, some other thing that's out of control of the applicant that they're waiting for at the local level, we can issue a provisional. And so I think you're going to see a lot of those. Um, starting to, to, to this next year um, because they'll be a little bit easier for us to issue than the annual. This strikes me as you guys at the BCC doing your best to smooth over some of this turbulence at a time when the, the locals might still be catching up and it speaks to, it's like I'm per perceiving this philosophy of trying to keep things moving um, as best as you can. Is that a philosophy that's going on at the BCC? Yeah, I mean, I just, I'll jump in here. I think, I think it's really important, and we want to underscore the point of how important it is to get people into the market, get them a license, get them the ability to get up and running and get a sense of how it is to operate in this newly regulated system. So to Lori's point of all the licenses that were issued, the temporary licenses in December, that was really big for us to get people their temporaries before the ability to get them those ended at the end of the year. So to have those folks in there and now, you know, getting up and running and getting a sense of how things are going to work, I think that's, that's really important for us. Just to dig in real quick, when you're getting an annual licensing, what are, tends to be the biggest snags? Is it declaring who's on the ownership? Is it the background checks? Is it uh, a CEQA review, if necessary, uh, for a store or, or distributors or things like that? What do you see consistently coming back as a snag? I think the per, uh, biggest thing is getting through the local jurisdiction process. Uh, I think that's probably the biggest hand, getting through building and planning. Maybe you have to have a conditional use permit or a special use permit, uh, getting through CEQA. I think some of the stuff we're seeing on our, our end, like getting a surety bond or going to get your fingerprints, those are just, made, it's education. Here's where you go to get that. So I think for us, it's probably the biggest holdup is at the local level. Well, let's stay with the issue of local control. You can't force uh, a city or county to do anything with regard to cannabis, and the total power rests with the city or county in terms of shaping what kind of cannabis commerce it wants to have locally. And this uh, idea goes back to uh, before America was America, when we were a bunch of religious fanatics founding colonies. Um, local control was paramount, and before there was counties or states, the rule was was that you know you could dictate to a large degree what was going on in your area. I think we've seen over the last two years that a lot of locals have said we are not prepared for this, we are not trained for this, we don't have a budget for this. Why do we have to do this? Uh, even though a lot of them demanded you know to be in the driver's seat for this, have you seen this as well? And and what can we do to train up locals? Uh, is there a way to do a best practices conference where uh, the state regulators who are really knowledgeable can drive some of the learnings down to the local levels? Uh, how can we get to the point where these local rules are copy-pastable for new jurisdictions? So I, I think it's important to mention one thing before we sort of dig into some of the stuff that we're doing right now. And I may have mentioned this when we were sitting here last year, although, I mean, I can't even remember what I did two weeks ago. So. Forgive me if I'm repeating myself, but I think in, in 2017, as we were leading up to January 1, um, I want to say that we spent about 120 days going to different conferences and local jurisdictions to talk to folks and really get a sense of what was going on. And I think that what we, what we took back was that we, we understood that a lot of them weren't going to be ready to go on January 1 of 2018. And we tried to just reinforce the point that we were always going to be a resource. And if people had questions, comments, or concerns, they could talk to us and they could get in touch with us. And that, I think that has helped. But I think to David's point, 
I think there's a lot more to be done, and um, you know, I think we're we're working toward that now with um, putting into place this uh, local liaison office that we're trying to hire folks for that can actually work with cities and counties directly. Um, and I think Lori might have a better sense of the timing on that, but I think we're trying to get that started and up and running because it is such a huge piece of the, the overall process. Yeah, I think we're finding that the locals are struggling just as confusing it is for our applicants. They're also confused on what the regulations say, what the state is doing. So uh, we've just really recognized that we have to have a lot more outreach. We've been doing a lot of outreach, but we need to do a lot more. And so that's why we've developed this local liaison unit. We've already hired uh, a, a manager for it. We're bringing on uh, at least about uh, nine people that are just gonna work directly with the local jurisdiction. And that's gonna include some of their applicants too that, they're have, that they are having trouble advising. So we're gonna work directly with them and then they're going to have somebody that they can call directly. Even though we respond to inquiries by email, you know, a lot of times people want to pick up the phone and get a real person, and we get that. And I love your idea of having, like, a best practices conference because we always talk about it. Everybody's going out to Colorado to go to these conferences. We, we, I think we do it better here, so we should do our own conference here. So. Right, the California way. Um, I, speaking of Colorado, they had an intergovernmental working group um, that was in operation for a while designed to play air traffic controller among all these different agencies because there's a lot of moving parts here. Do we have something similar in California yet? Is that maybe on the horizon or is that being accomplished in another way? How are you synergizing with the CDFA, the CDPH, taxes, you name it? Well, so just to give you an example, when we would have these sort of um, intergovernmental meetings every so often where we'd all get together and try to keep everybody on the same page with updates, and I think we'd have probably 35 to 40 different representatives in this group. So it's, it's the folks that David mentioned, it's public health, it's food and ag, it's CDTFA, but it's also EDD and it's water boards and it's fish and wildlife and it's, you know, I mean, you can go on and on down the list. It's Cal OSHA, it's all these different all these different agencies. Um, so the coordination is, um, it's not always easy, but I think we've, we've gotten the process down pretty well where there's always an open line of communication and especially with food and ag and public health because uh, those are, we gotta work in lockstep so many times with those agencies. So um, I think we're doing a pretty good job. It's never, it's never as, as uh, smooth as you want it to be. It's always, uh, the coordination's always tough, especially when people are so busy. Um, but I think we, we do a pretty good job. One thing I've noticed uh, covering cannabis legalization for nine years is that the California's pace so far is not at all off pace compared to how other states have gone. When I look at Colorado, Washington, Oregon, we saw the same ratio of banned counties to cities and counties that allow it. We saw the same pace of uh, adoption in terms of implementation at the local level. Um, in 2016, four states legalized cannabis, Nevada, California, Maine, and Massachusetts. We beat all of those states in terms of implementation and tax revenue taken. Nevada started earlier than us, but we were much bigger than them, and so we eclipsed them. Maine's governor blocked implementation, so they made zero dollars uh, on their legalization. Massachusetts, you think you guys got local control problems, go back to Mass and see how the game's played back there. Um, but that, you know, that said, are we... Are you seeing the pace of implementation improve, slow down? What's your concerns there? Because on my side, I see medical dispensaries in places like Point Wainimi that have never allowed them, or Lompoc. And I am starting to see things break up. Emeryville, um, places that on the cannabis beat you would have never heard of before now are finding a way to licensing. Can you, can, what, what do you guys think about the pace? I think it's improving. We're, we're seeing it improve. I'm going to say, but it's not as fast as we need it to go. I will say that because you guys want, you guys are, you guys go um, uh, pretty fast. So even for the state to keep up with you, it's a challenge and we try. And so I think for us, we, we are just constantly trying to, what more can we do to get cities and counties to embrace uh, cannabis regulation? Because of course we think um, if you're regulating it, that's got to be better than not regulating it. But I think we're starting to see that movement uh, again. I, I mean, we, 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 we thought it would be at a quicker pace than it was, but um, we're getting there. What are some of the bright spots that have surprised you? I mean, Salinas has taken off. Santa Barbara County has taken off. 
Well, I mean, I look at, you know, part of what I do is I, I look so much at the news every day and see what's happening. And I think right after November, after the, the recent election, I think you saw a lot of local ordinances on ballots all across the state pass, um, which I think we were all encouraged by. And now, you know, it just depends upon the rate of implementation. But I think a lot of those uh, folks that are in cities and counties that had ordinances passed in November were among those licenses that we were issuing in December, that last push, because I think people sensed, hey, this is our opportunity to get into the market under the temporary licensure and see how, how quickly we can get up and going. Um, so yeah, hopefully in 2019 that, that pace sort of continues and we see more and more of that, but we are, we are seeing it and that's, I think, the, the uh, encouraging thing. I, I'm just going to add, I definitely think having our final regulations in place is helping because before they weren't sure, we kept changing them, right? And cities and counties don't like that, it's just like you guys probably don't like it either. <laughs> so I think having just consistency is going to really help things this year. Um, is there any chance that locals will say, gosh, this seems like a lot of work. I'm just going to defer to the state in this regard. I feel like when you look at alcoholic beverage control, there's a lot more deference to a state regime and, and some very local sort of choose your own adventure type choices you make about time, place, and manner of alcohol delivery, but it's, it's pretty much run at the state level. Um, has, any, has there been any talk about locals deferring to state or is that just way off the table? We haven't heard too much of it. We would, we would welcome that, by the way. Uh, coming from alcoholic beverage control, uh, full local control has been an adjustment for me because I'm used to, at ABC, you were the sole licensing authority. So you did defer to the locals for land use issues, but the, the state made the final decision. So I think we'd welcome that, um, but I don't know, Alex. Yeah, but I think, I think, I think I think more probably took the extra time to just sort of deliberate what they wanted. I think if they were going to accept our rules as written, we would have seen more come online sooner is my, my If thought. I was a business owner and I was told you I was in a band town or a town that was on the fence, can you give me one, two, three action items, things I, sh I, should, be, I should be definitely doing uh, locally that are table stakes things that if I'm not doing, we can't even be having this conversation? Is it just civic engagement? Is it lobbying? Is it writing your own initiative? Um, yeah, what are you telling business owners who, who want to get this going locally? Move? <laughs> that's, that's one consideration. <laughs> but, uh, right, I mean, obviously, if you want to be in business now and you're in a banned county, uh, that, that is, you have to move, right? But if you're where you, if you want to stay where you are because you've been doing that there for, for many years, it's really engaging the local jurisdiction. We're starting to see uh, cannabis business owners run for city council, board of supervisors. Shout out to Cody Base in Lake Tahoe. Yeah. I was just going to mention Cody. Which, which I, and, and they're winning. Right? So there you go. Do you guys know the story of South Lake Tahoe? Clap your hands if you do. Uh, it's, it's, it's worth, it's, right. we gotta talk about that. It's worth talking about. Um, so Cody Bass is a longtime activist. He's from Plano, Texas. His dad was convicted of smuggling. He got like a sophomore uh, high school education, dropped out, became a ski bum, came to Tahoe, saw Tahoe, said he was never leaving, worked the chairlifts, got into medical marijuana, grew it, helped uh, start a dispensary in Berkeley, cut his teeth on regulations there, opened a club in Tahoe, spent 10 years going round and round with locals over ticky-tack nonsense. He, they really raked him over the coals as a small business owner. Uh, last year, Cody Bass ran for city council and uh, on the election day, swept out all the older incumbents of South Lake Tahoe and uh, went out into his community, learned what the real issues were, which were fire control and local housing issues with regard to Airbnb, seized on those issues, not cannabis, and now Cody Bay sits on the South Lake Tahoe City Council. <laughs> Anybody can do this, it's really inspiring. Um, this week, the South Lake Tahoe City Council voted to pass its uh, local cannabis ordinance. Cody Bass had to recuse because he's on the council now. So he was in the audience advocating for his business and I think it was a three to one vote to ensure that that small business has a place in this system. So shout out to Cody here. Yeah. Um, to move on to final regulations, which are permanent down now, um, the number one thing that people were keeping an eye on in them was the non-storefront delivery license type. Now this is what we guys know as retail deliveries, and um, the license type wasn't in Proposition 64. It actually came out of Governor Brown's office during a legislative session. 
And I'm never sure why he did this or his office did this because he's never really carried much water for cannabis. But it's a real revolutionary uh, license type because most uh, states, legalization states, there's 10 of them now, do not allow delivery. You're from the Department of Alcoholic Beverage Control. The idea of driving around alcohol and delivering it gave law enforcement officials hives for years. But here we are now with a situation where there's over 100 uh, delivery services that are licensed to deliver all across the state now and cut into the lack of access issues in these band towns and provide um, you know, taxed and regulated cannabis to the people that voted for it. What has been the response to the final regulations which codified that storefront license type, that non-storefront license type? Um, can you take me into, not the backlash or the blowback, but just the reaction to finalizing that? I mean, so, so I think overwhelmingly positive in terms of, of the allowance for delivery. Um, I think the road was, was a little bumpy along the way getting there. I think you saw you know, the response from League of Cities and police chiefs, but I think the overwhelming point was just that this is what the people voted for, this is what they wanted. Um, and there was far too many instances where I think there was some number I saw where people had to drive, you know, on average 60 miles just to get access to a, to a licensed retailer. And for a lot of people, especially patients, that's, that's not a possibility. So I think that when you look at, when you look at allowing delivery, I think it just is, it's common sense more than anything else. And that's uh, the direction it was headed. I, I think I, it was. I think we were a little overwhelmed too. That one sentence in over 150 pages of text got the most comments. I think we got uh, well over a few thousand comments for wow. and against. It was huge. Uh, but we we were get, we from the beginning. We always felt if we issue a uh, e any retail license has the ability to deliver, and if we issue that license, trying to like tell that licensee you can only deliver in this area and that you would have to have drivers try to figure out when they leave that area would almost be impossible to regulate and so that was our our our, our that was our opinion from the beginning and then we decided we, we were getting so many questions we needed to put it in the regs and um, that was like I said very controversial but I think it was the right decision um, we'll, we'll see what happens because I know there's still uh, you know, many folks that aren't happy with it at the local level. So the final rules were chaptered by the Office of Administrative Law, which scrubs them for legality. And then you guys do your homework before you propose them in terms of whether or not you, you think it's going to withstand a legal challenge. Can you um, take us into the legal precedent that might put us on um, firm footing for allowing um, this delivery license type? Is it? I, yeah. I, I think it's it's the statute itself. It's how we interpret the statute that you can't prevent delivery on any public road. So I think that's where we're going to be. You know, that is where we're going to have. It's a right of way issue. It's, right. Um, but of course, we don't know what the legal challenge is going to be. We we haven't gotten one yet. So um, and then you know the bureau won't be defending that. That that would be our attorney general's office would represent us in something like that. Um, I, I understand that maybe there's some. Um, you know, new law that's, you know, we're in a new legal territory in that it, it might have to do with what's delivery, where is the point of transaction, especially now with Amazon, like this issue of the legality of cannabis delivery at the local level is bigger than cannabis. It relates to online commerce and taxes and the, the, the fundamental limits of police powers and local control in an interconnected digitized society where these transactions could be occurring any, anywhere. And I'm trying to find a question in there but uh, I, I guess, uh, did, that, did that come up in the talk? You know, Amazon, e-commerce, where is that place of transaction? Is there any parallel or analog, you know, industries you were looking at here? Well, I think it's tough because you can, still can't deliver cannabis through the U.S. mail because there's federal implications. Uh, we don't, in our regs, if you read, we don't let you do it by drone either. You can't, you know, there's drop. <laughs> Someday, maybe, right? Someday. So I, I think... You know, in a lot of ways, cannabis delivery is still by vehicle, and so um, so it's similar to Amazon and those things, and those questions came up. But I think for us, it was just simple. 
if we give you a delivery license, you're, you, you're entitled to go anywhere in the state to deliver your drivers, and we're regulating you. you there's very strict regulations on what a, a regulated del delivery driver has to do. There's, there's limits on how much they can carry. They have to have GPS. The licensee has to know where they are. So we feel like public, s that we're, the public safety is more safe with regulated delivery drivers than all the unlicensed delivery drivers that are out there. Um, you know, the opposition and the proponents of delivery made for a real interesting mix of strange bedfellows. We saw uh, a cannabis union, the UFCW Local 5, team up with, uh, I believe, maybe the Teamsters and the police and the league and um, versus uh, others who wanted delivery in the industry. And we also saw local cities sort of mad that you were kind of, you know, messing with let's face it, some like local oligopolies or, or limited amount of licensing. Um, you know, who, who do you think is going to lead the challenge if there is going to be one? Is there a face of this? It seemed like coming out of delivery, I haven't heard one major group be like, we're gonna take the banner up on this. We're gonna, we're gonna fight this over the top. Do you know where the challenge might be coming from? I don't think we do at this point. Um. Yeah, it's it's tough to say. I mean, I, I, we saw the the whole wandering weed campaign, and I'm not sure if we. It recall. was really hackneyed, and it was very um, under budgeted and yeah, sad. It was very, uh, cringeworthy. I would I would say cringeworthy also. So yeah, that was maybe they lost their their ardor for this. But you know, one specific delivery that I think is going to ramp you know amplify down through time is um, just because locals quote unquote maybe not have won this round, they still have a lot of power and they might do other things to try to check delivery at the local level. Can you go into the specifics of delivery licensing with regard to um, how close you got to be to a market to drop it there? I understand that San Diego was saying that like, look, yeah, Caliva can drop in San Diego. Caliva's a San Jose brand or was a San Jose brand, but they have to leave from a licensed Caliva, Caliva, uh, storefront and then go directly to the customer, arguably in San Diego. Um, I think this has to do with a quote ice cream ice cream truck model versus a courier model. Um, and is there where is going to be the clarifying points in delivery going forward? Does Caliva need a delivery hub in San Diego to drop a licensed delivery hub around San Diego to drop in San Diego? According to the state regulations, as long as they're leaving from their licensed premises, wherever that is, I mean, they can't uh, necessarily stop along the way and pick up cannabis somewhere else, but as long as they're going straight to their, they can stop for rest breaks and things, but as long as they're leaving from their licensed delivery, that can be anywhere and they can deliver in San Diego. Now there's restrictions, you can't deliver to like a school or, you know, a public building. You have to, you have to go to an, you know, actual physical residential address. So. Uh, but what we're starting to see is, uh, you know, San Francisco uh, City Attorney just came out with uh, a memo saying that they're going to restrict delivery. Just uh, you have to have a license with the City of San Francisco in order to deliver. And I believe they're not going to allow what we call the ice cream truck or the dynamic delivery. Now, cities and counties can be more restrictive than our regulations, so, um, but they would be enforcing that on their own. The state wouldn't be enforcing something like that. So I think it's just, you're just gonna see a patchwork of what cities and counties are doing to uh, licensees in their area and what they're gonna require. I know some of them want the tax revenue, so if Caliva's coming in from the Bay Area to San Diego and they're making a delivery, they want that tax revenue also. It sounds like it's uh, to be determined uh you know, we're going to have to actually practice, you know, the delivery license model to kind of suss out some of the more granular limits of, of, of it and, and how big cities barriers can, you know, be, how big a barrier cities can erect to, you know, this sort of right for these businesses. Um, just to switch, you know, to talk about more about final regulations, um, underneath their, underneath delivery, which was the big one, I'm trying to think of like the second most commented item you've gotten. I've heard a lot about packaging and childproofing and, um, and you know, which has been giving a lot of good progressives and environmentalists heartburn. Um, <laughs> where, where, how did you land, what, what was the um, regulation you landed on and how did you land there? 
Well, we are, uh, one of our proposed regulations, because you know last year we had our emergency regs where childproof uh, packaging occurred at manufacturing, and then we, when we came out with our proposed in midsummer, we actually proposed that the exit packaging that's required by statute when the, at retail, that we combine that and say that's going to be your childproof packaging and it would be encompassed in the exit packaging. We got a ton of comments on that also. Um, that did not stay. Um, we had to change that. Public health is requiring uh, childproof packaging at manufacture for uh, all, all manufactured products, and including flour. Uh, there is a year uh, period to transition. So that did not, you know, that was something we proposed. Um, that didn't stick. So um, we're back to childproof packaging as it originally was in the emergency reg. Which was, um, you have a year to get everything into individual childproof bags. Until that point, you can um, keep it in the exit bag. And For the next year, yes. You know, I, sometimes we do try to uncomplicate things, but it just seems to get complicated again. So, um, because I don't, I, we're, we're of the mind, if we can make it easy to understand and uncomplicate it, it's a lot easier for people to comply. Um, how much control do you have over testing in phase three regulations and where those limits are? Is that all with the CDPH or were those fails in the BCC regs? Uh, testing labs is under the uh, the Bureau. Uh, yeah. it originally, way back in the day, it was under CDPH, okay. and then it got transferred to the Bureau, so we're responsible for all the testing. Uh, very challenging, uh, it, it actually, like very strict testing regulations. Right, we've had phase three testing rules come into effect on January 1st. Everything made before January 1st, you could sell, but after January 1st, you have to pass tests not only for pest, you know, pesticides and pathogens and purity and labeling, but you got to um, not fail for heavy metals and mycotoxins. What have you heard in the early days of phase three going live? What has been, uh, is it going as planned? And um, what are things failing for? What are things that producers need to look out for going forward? So it's, it, I think a lot of people were nervous in December. So along with everything else we were doing, everybody was very nervous about phase three testing. Um, I think they were worried a lot of our tab, uh, labs would not be ready to do phase three testing. So one of the things we did, uh, we sent our lab folks and they went and visited every single lab in California to look at their equipment, to make sure they understand the phase three testing, to see how they were using it. And... Um, you know, we, we haven't had any issues. Most of our labs are ready to do phase three testing. They already had the equipment. They got all their staff trained. So we haven't heard too much about it yet. Um, but then again, still a lot of, there hasn't been as much phase three testing yet because a lot of product was before January 1st. So uh, we're continuing to monitor that. Um, you know, failed batches continues to be, uh, we have a failure rate of just under 13%. And that continues to be mainly for labeling issues, which should make you feel okay, because it's the cannabinoids labeling issues, and then probably next in line is pesticides. So those are, uh, but really way below the labeling. Yeah, I think, um, I think if you notice, if you were following from you know, July up until now, uh, we've got a weekly report that we send out that you can get access to and have mailed to you every week so you can see. Um, I think the failure rate has continued to drop. I think it started at about 20, and like Lori mentioned, it's under 13% now, and it continues to move down. And I think that just shows that um, the adaptability and how people are sort of getting used to the, the standards and, and, uh, and things are progressing, so that's, that's good. One thing I hear from the industry is we're seeing a lot of variance in our lab results. We're concerned about the quality of the labs we're dealing with. I understand that they have until the end of this year to get ISO certified, if that's correct, under international standards for how they're operating, but they're all allowed to sort of skin the cat their own way as long as the test results come out valid. They can follow their own sort of protocols. How confident are you in your ability to watch the watchers, or is that really with the CDPH? Well, uh, we do work, CDPH has a, a very uh, cannabis lab too, so we do work with them because they're looking at all the manu, you know, because a lot of the problems when you see when things fail at the laboratory is the manufacturing process. So it's really working with CDPH to make sure 
that we're looking at these manufacturing, if we're seeing like a lot of failed batches coming from one manufacturer, they're going in and seeing how they're doing their manufacturing process. So I, I think that's gonna get, that's, that's all gonna, that's a process for us and for CDPH and working with the industry, but I think we're getting through that. Um, um, do you guys have any interaction at the federal level? Are you gonna be doing any lobbying or um, do you keep an eye on what's happening in DC this year? Uh, I, I know last year, you know, you said you got to do what you're going to do, and they're going to do what they're going to do, and we're going to cross that bridge when we get to it. Um, but it seems like things are building in Congress for, uh, you know, exempting certain states from the Controlled Substances Act under the States Act. Blumenauer just introduced S420 today because, uh, you know, that's our favorite number. Um, I, what, when you look at Congress, do you just go, uh, I'm not even, or do you guys engage? Uh, I wouldn't say that we engage. I say that I say that we we monitor things, and I think we we definitely pay attention. I think um, more talk uh, at the federal level can can be encouraging. Um, not always know how much stock to put in it, I guess. But um, thankfully, again, we we continue to have enough on our plate that we're we're focused on getting our business done. But um, I think anytime you hear more chatter about about mo any movement at the federal level, that's that's somewhat encouraging. Is that something you can endorse at a, at a state agency level? Like, we endorse the States Act, or is that, no? We usually, like with, with our own legislation, even in California, we, we stay pretty much hands off until it's, you know, if something passes and we have to implement some of that or it affects our program in some way, that's when we, we jump in and take action. But until that time, we, we stay pretty, um, pretty much out of any debate about legislation. Speaking of California legislation in 2019, what do you hope comes out of this legislative session, if anything? Um, what are some red hot fixes we need, if anything? Do you sense any signals from the governor's office in terms of what direction he wants the legislature to go? They have this super majority, they theoretically could get things done, yeah. I, I, cannabis is always popular during lead season, so that's great. See, it's contagious. Uh, so we expect there's going to be a lot of bill I, bills out there. Um, I'm not really sure. Um, they, they, you know, I've seen a little bit on labs um, with the certificate of analysis allowing oh, really? for like amendments, but I really haven't seen too much. I'm really hoping if there is a real problem with our regulations or something that we would be working with the industry to help. You know, we're, we're more, when we say final regs, that, that's not really final. Um, we expect, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> hey, go figure. Well, I mean, um, alcohol <laughs> regs are still yeah, evolving. Yeah, they don't change nothing in now. You know what I mean, on regs? Uh, but we're, we know we're gonna be doing some reg packages this year and making some fixes. So, um, so don't, f don't, have no fear, we'll be out there again with probably, but it won't be these large regulations package, so I think they'll go fairly smoothly because we're only going to be dealing with, you know, a little bit of the regs. Rep Bonta introduced a tax uh, sort of relief measure um, into a democratically controlled legislature, um, you know, that is really interested in raising revenue right now. Um, you know, you guys don't control the tax levels. They're in Prop 64, and it takes a two-thirds vote of the legislature to amend them. Um, a lot of people in the audience are hoping for tax relief to drive more people into the legal market. Um, you can't give that, but do you see uh, other forces that are affecting prices, like um, the, a decline in the price of cannabis coming up? I mean, I think I, I can't really speak to the decline in, uh, in in prices of cannabis, but as far as the taxes are concerned, I mean, this obviously we saw this bill, uh, the same bill last year, and it's one of several bills that are going to get reintroduced this year or already have been uh, reintroduced. Um, you know, can't really speak to whether 11% is going to make that much more of a difference than 15% for most operators, uh, but. Um, you know, hopefully it's a start, and uh, you know, I think we saw that bill not not make it through last year, basically because I think they they looked at what tax revenue was coming in, and the thought process was, well, if if taxes aren't at the level that we're we were expecting, then why would we cut taxes? So you can look at that a number of different ways, um, but um, I don't know that there's going to be more of a inclination to make that work this year. I think a lot of it, again, is going to depend on what we see from CDTFA's tax reports. There's another one coming up, I think, in the, within the next week or maybe even a couple of days. So I'm um, definitely going to keep an eye out on that and see how things progress. Lori, have you seen the CD, CDTFA Q4 revenue totals? Can you, can you 
I have not. Okay. I, I'm not. I'm not in their secret squirrel world. So All right. they, I, I see. I it called them yesterday. They wouldn't does. tell me. They said February 14th for a Q4 revenue, and you know we probably raised several hundred million last year. It's uh, you know a couple hundred million here or there, and you might end up to real money. Um, <laughs> this year, you guys got 10 million to do some equity um, type of grants. Um, that doesn't seem like very much money. Uh, <laughs> But I wanted to uh, throw it to you about, you know, when can we expect an equity uh, applica grant application form to come out and what might be on it? I know we got two minutes. So that, that's going to be coming out very, very soon. That's all I can say. And uh, we try to simplify this, right? That We keep saying that. Uh, we have 10 million, which is not a lot, to uh, provide to local jurisdictions that have equity programs. You get so, one license with 10 million dollars. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry. So we tried to make an application process that's going to be very easy for the locals to apply and us to be able to uh, track what what they're doing with the money. And we're hoping this catches on and there we're very successful for the for the jurisdictions that get this money that. You know, maybe we're going to see more local jurisdictions adopting a local equity program. The cannabis industry isn't the first one to face equity problems, and there's been other attempts in the past, you know, small business loans, minority uh, points on government contracts. Where else can people look in the state apparatus for um, a leg up, if anywhere? I mean, you've been in, in the state for a while now. What are the go-to programs for, you know, help before cannabis existed? Yeah, so I think we we got it. We have to do more. M money's great, and uh, but I think at the state level, and and we're looking, we keep looking at this issue. How can we make you know reduce barriers to entry to get people into uh, licenses to assist them with with getting a license? You know, one of the things the equity program, the the legislation that Senator Bradford uh, passed is uh, we are going to have four people that just provide technical assistance to the local jurisdictions that have equity program and their equity applicants. So I think we need to do a better job of making sure people understand how to get licensed and we try to reduce that, those barriers. But also we have to encourage, you know, we've got a lot of small cultivators that are trying to sell their product through the supply chain. How do we incentivize our distributors and our retailers to buy from those equity applicant cultivators or manufacturers and so and and it's just that's a bigger conversation than just the bureau it's really engaging the industry with this and seeing how we what we can do if there's something we can do with our regs is, is how we change you know how do we incentivize other businesses and I think that's what we're going to look to explore this year two more questions uh, there's one more um, enforcement's a reality this year what is your priorities so just uh, really quickly, if I had the breaking news, little music in the background, um, we just put out a release this morning uh, about our enforcement unit um, sh shutting down an illegal retail or illegal delivery service in Sacramento and an illegal storefront in Los Angeles. Um, so activity is happening on that front. Um, it's we've, we've talked about this a few times, how 2019 is going to be you know, a year of enforcement, we're going to really get out there. Our uh, cannabis enforcement unit is working with local law enforcement, local governments. Um, we're getting, we're continuing to get complaints about illegal activity. We're following up on all of those. And so I think you're going to see more of this type of activity. And we have a public education, public awareness campaign coming out. Where we're really going to try to get after those illegal operators. Um, digital messages, not just the cease and desist letters, and then also um, really trying to encourage the consumer to buy from their licensed retail location. So that campaign hopefully is going to be starting uh, sometime early next month, and you'll you'll definitely see some things happening pretty quickly. Well, guys, we're out of time. I just want to okay, let you know. Okay, but wait. I'm sorry. I just have one question. Well, yeah. Let's hear it for David and Lori and Alex Reversal one more time.